My name is Nathan Ravor, and this is my sophomore research project entitled A Film About Films, Psychology in the Motion Picture. Film. There's nothing quite like it. It inspires us, educates us, and brings us closer together. Creating film is a true art form, a delicate process that, when done skillfully, can affect the lives of many. So what does one need to make a good movie? Of course, there are the technical aspects, how to use a camera and whatnot, and then there's the purely artisanal side to film as well. But when it comes down to it, I'd argue that in order to tell a good story, especially when doing so through film, one must have a good understanding of psychology. By knowing the basics of the human psyche, the storyteller, or more specifically the director, can portray a story with accuracy and truly connect with the audience. I would also argue that, reversely, film has had a major effect on the human psyche since its inception and invention over a century ago. In this way, film affects psychology, and psychology affects film in innumerable ways. Good. Film is the process, art, or business of making movies, according to the Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary. The business portion will be mentioned later, and the art of film will be discussed at length, as they are both immensely important. But the process of making a movie is also paramount to a true understanding of this art form. Essentially, there are five basic stages of film development. First is the developmental stage, which includes coming up with a story, script, and budget. This is followed by pre-production, or preparing for filming by scouting locations, casting actors and hiring crew, scheduling, and designing the sets. Next is production, or filming, and post-production, or editing. Finally, one must distribute the film. The director has unique and impactful responsibilities. Essentially, the director is the creative driver of the film. He takes a script, which he has often written, and makes it appear on the screen. Directors oversee everything from how the shots will be taken, to what sort of music will play, to the types of subtleties that need to be portrayed by the actors. I would argue that a director needs a good understanding of psychology for a number of reasons. First, it allows him to read the subjects with more accuracy. A psychologically accurate script will hit home more with the audience than an inaccurate one. It can also help him decide what sorts of images and sounds would create more emotion and reaction from viewers. And most importantly, a good psychological basis can help the director formulate decisions about how characters should act, react, and behave in general. Images in our mind are not the images that we have on the screen. An image in the mind is a complex connotation and organization system that allows us to communicate and understand. Mental images can't be what they are in the movies in that many words, most words, cannot be captured directly with an image. How could one draw yesterday? What mental image could appear with the word cooperation? The fact is that there is no single photographic style image we could possibly use to imagine abstract concepts. Even images that could be drawn, like bus, can be viewed in the mind's eye an infinite number of ways. Film is just the opposite. Film, in itself, is a visual art comprised of two-dimensional concrete images. The challenge for the filmmaker is to create a visual, photograph-style image that evokes a mental and emotional image in the viewer. It's easier with certain topics. An eight-year-old could photograph a dog and invoke the image of dog in the audience's mind. But it takes skill to film anger, fear, love, or yesterday. Dr. Richard Nanian is a professor at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. He studied literature and playwriting and is currently an assistant professor of literature. I recently interviewed him via email on the topics of psychology and film. In this interview, Dr. Nanian supplied the perfect example of a director's use of imagery for psychological resonance with a quote from the great silent film actor and director Buster Keaton. Keaton once said, quote, Tragedy is a close-up, comedy a long shot. End quote. When you think about it, this stands very true in most films. In tragedy, the camera is usually zoomed in, bringing us closer to the pain or the sadness of the character. Comedies are framed further away from the actors, but the camera zoomed out. This is more profound than it seems to be on the surface. As Dr. Nanian puts it, quote, This reflects a psychological truth. Tragedy is about closeness and empathy, while comedy is about distance and objectivity. The director's manipulation of the camera changes our relationship and thus our emotional response to the action. End quote. 
This is Carl Jung. He was a psychologist, and his work was and is paramount to our modern ideas about characters in life, literature, drama, and film. Jung built on another psychologist, Sigmund Freud's, ideas about our minds having components that together make us who we are. In his theory, our minds consist of different parts. These parts are the conscious, which includes the ego or balancer, personal unconscious, which includes the id or impulse center, and the superego, or conscious-like good side of human nature whose roots are in the conscious, and the evolutionary and inherited collective unconscious. This collective unconscious contains emotions and behaviors and personalities common to all people everywhere. These repeating models of human behavior are known as archetypes. While there are an unknowable number of archetypes, Jung described four major ones from which the others can be derived. These are the self, referring to the unification of the conscious and unconscious in a person, the shadow, which represents our darker, instinctual side, the anima, the female component of men, or the animus, the male component of woman, and finally, the persona, or the way we represent ourselves to the world. From these four are derived the 12 major personality archetypes, which can be seen very directly in different characters in literature and film, though they are all present in different amounts in all people everywhere. First is the innocent, meaning a person who is good, faithful, optimistic, and naive. Second is the orphan, also called the everyman or the person next door. This is the character who just wants to blend in and be normal. This is followed by the hero, the caregiver, the explorer, the rebel, and the lover. Following the lover is the creator, or the artisan. After that is the jester, who lightens the mood and believes in you only live once. Next is the sage, who knows all and possesses great intelligence. He's followed by the magician, who foresees circumstances and seems to always make things happen and know what's going on. Last but not least is the ruler. About 50 years ago, a man named Albert Bandura conducted a groundbreaking psychology experiment. According to Kendra Cherry's article, Albert Bandura Biography, in this experiment children were told to watch a film of a woman being violent with a bobo doll. The woman, seen here, was punching, kicking, and yelling at the doll. When these children were placed in a room with many toys including a bobo doll, they immediately started acting aggressive and violent toward the toy. Not only did they mimic the adults' actions, but they also came up with their own ideas about how to be violent to the doll. It's as if this short film completely changed the way they believed they were supposed to properly behave with the doll. The most fascinating part about it is that it broke a lot of previous notions psychologists had about behavior. Before this experiment, most psychologists believed that the way we acted was due to two major things, reward and reinforcement. But the boy you see here was neither rewarded for these actions, nor was the video shown multiple times for reinforcement. He simply used his own cognition and decided to mimic the lady in the original video. Bandura called this phenomena observational learning. Basically, we see someone we respect on the screen, we internalize, and we replicate the actions. This experiment in itself proves some of the profound effects that film, and even other art forms and literature, have on the human psyche. When we watch a movie, we have an innate, natural desire to be like the people on the screen. I really do mean everyone. Women, and mothers, men, girls, and boys everywhere. There are counter-arguments. If you're a humanist, you might be wondering, as Dr. Nanian puts it, quote, but which is cause and which is effect? Does someone have a juvenile sense of good and evil because one goes to see silly action films like Independence Day? Or does one like those films because one has a juvenile sense of good and evil? While there is much truth in this statement, I feel that the results from experiments like the Bobo Doll experiment and others make it almost irrefutable that we are in many ways shaped by what we see others do. I'm sure Dr. Nanian, Albert Bandura, and most other thinkers could agree that there is a balance somewhere between the two, though where exactly the line is drawn, no one could ever know. Thus far, psychology has proven to permeate the art of film in an incredible number of ways. The reasons we like drama and film also seem to have psychological roots. This is Joseph Campbell. He theorized that there are single, unifying stories and myths that unite us as humans, Essentially, he agreed with much of Jung's work about the collective unconscious, but brought it to more of a societal than a personal level. In short, he believed that like Jung's theory about ancestral personalities or archetypes, we also have inherited stories and ideas put into our heads. His idea was that the similarities and myths, such as creation stories and flood stories and fall of man stories from cultures that never met, may have to do with this unifying truth.
These ideas about a unifying psychological theory could be compared to Albert Einstein's views of a unifying scientific theory. Albert Palmer is an Australian screenwriter and teacher at Australia's National Film School in Sydney. In a blog post titled My Philosophy, he theorized based on Joseph Campbell's ideas that we see movies for three reasons. His three reasons were to expand our emotional bandwidth, reconnect with our higher selves, and remind ourselves that we're not alone. Another theory, more simplistic and whimsical, comes from Tom Chirac, the president of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. In an interview with Vikas Shah for the blog Thought Economics, he said the following, quote, Movies are about escapism. Movies are about sitting in a theater, watching something, watching a story unfold with people I don't know, watching that happen and emoting an emotion, knowing that for those two hours, when I walk into the theater, I don't have to worry about what is going on outside. I lose myself in what I'm watching. Movies can educate too. They tell us things we could never have known. They tell us things we might not know, and they give us a way to explore the past, the present, and the future." End quote. A final opinion on why people like drama comes from Dr. Richard Nanian in my interview with him. To paraphrase Dr. Nanian, the thing that separates humans from animals is our need to find a purpose in existence. Animals can have many other human qualities, including intelligence, but none of them look for purpose. We find purpose in life through art in its many forms. Drama takes stories and narratives and puts them in front of us. Humans enjoy seeing the craziness that is life be structured and laid out through staging and acting. Storytelling domesticates the wild and uncontrollable series of events we call existence. On movies, to quote Dr. Nanian, quote, movies can do much more than live theater visually and, to a lesser extent, auditorially, but their greatest freedom is to put the audience in any relationship to the action a director wants. That opens up all sorts of possibilities." End quote. Obviously, there are a lot of theories out there. Perhaps the man himself, Walt Disney, put it best. Quote, Pictures still speak the most universally understood language. End quote. The reasons people enjoy drama are all rather positive. Thus, it seems counterintuitive that people actually like and will pay to see movies in the horror genre. Hardly emotional, these films break most of the rules for why people enjoy drama. So why then do we like horror? There are three essential elements to a horror film according to John P. Hess's page, The Psychology of Scary Movies, on his website, Filmmaker IQ. These are tension or suspense build up in the idea itself of going to a horror movie, relevance or societal relations, and unrealism. Psychology experiments demonstrate the importance of this last piece. One study found that people had a far easier time watching a horrifically violent but fictional horror film, but could hardly stand watching a significantly less violent but still bloody documentary. There are an incredibly large number of theories as to why we enjoy horror, most pertaining to particular types of people. The previously mentioned Carl Jung believed they tap into the collective unconscious and the id, expressing archetypes such as the shadow and the mother. Sigmund Freud believed horror films express the uncanny, which are images in our unconscious that are suppressed by society. It also may be that the surrealism of a horror movie is like being in a waking dream, bringing out deeper unconscious images and connections while we're still awake. Teenagers specifically enjoy horror for a number of different reasons. The subculture types, or teenagers in need of an identity, tend to like horror movies out of curiosity and fascination, according to film scholar Noel Carroll. Sensation-seeking teenagers, or adrenaline junkies who also like activities such as roller coaster riding, enjoy the secure rush of doing something that creates adrenaline while still knowing that they are completely safe. Teenage couples who enjoy horror movies exemplify the gender socialization theory. Essentially, guys like seeing their girls get scared and cuddle up, while girls like seeing their guys be brave. In recent years, with the historical turning point being the movie Halloween, horror films have been about sexual or scantily dressed girls being killed by a creepy murder. In these films, the theme, according to Dr. Nanian, is, quote, See that girl? She just had sex. It wasn't with you. She deserves to die. End quote. In these films, audiences identify with the killer. And, ever so shockingly, the most popular audience with horror movies over the past couple of decades has been sexually frustrated teenage boys. Older audiences and older horror movies are the reverse of the killer identification films of recent years, according to Dr. Nanian. In them, the audience identifies with the victim. Just like the epical shower scene in the classic Hitchcock film Psycho, we know the victim is about to get it. 
And when they do, we feel for them without actually feeling their pain. Horror movies are also an expression of grander societal fears. This is proven just by looking through history. The early films were gothic horror, most likely influenced by literature from authors like Edgar Allan Poe. During the 50s, society in America was afraid of nuclear weapons and communists. This alien-like view of commies and the known side effects of radiation are reflected in the movies of the era, a lot of which are full of mutants. They come from another world, spawned in the light years of space, unleashed to take over the bodies and souls of the people of our planet. In the sexual revolution of the 60s, hippies and other cultures emerged, resulting in most horror being of the psychosexual category. The 70s brought occult horror and big box office thrillers, while the late 70s and into the 80s were slasher and teen horrors. This was followed by even more teen horror in the 90s, and finally a resurgence of psychological horror. The 2000s brought what has come to be called torture porn, brought about due to the increased ability for realism with special effects technology and the current societal fear, terrorism. Recently, we've entered a zombie movie phase. I believe this may be due to our current culture of drifting through life encumbered by our phones and virtual lives. Sometimes we are the living dead. According to Dr. James B. Weaver, we also might have certain instinctual psychological reasons for enjoying horror. The morbid fascination theory states that we have an innate desire to know about dangers in our environment, inherited from our evolutionary ancestors needing to know about predators and other environmental dangers. This explains why we feel the need to rubberneck when there's a car crash on the highway. We instinctually need to know exactly what happened. The effect of the art of film on society over this past century is almost incomparable. Just as an example, as early as 2001, the British Tourist Authority stated that 20% of the visitors to Britain came because of the way England was portrayed in film and television, according to Vikas Shah's blog posting, The Role of Film in Society. This shows how film has had an effect not just on people's psyches, but also on society as a whole. In a way, the collective psyche of the entire world has been affected by film. Film has also proven to have not just influence, but also very positive effects on people's individual minds. Some of these effects are very profound. The scholar S.C. E. Noah Erg stated in his paper entitled, Cinema is Good for You, the effects of cinema attendance on self-reported anxiety or depression in happiness that, quote, cinema attendance can have independent and robust effects on mental well-being because visual stimulation can cue a range of emotions and the collective experience of these emotions through the cinema provides a safe environment in which to experience roles and emotions we might not otherwise be free to experience. To put it statistically, according to a study done by Comlin, Bergen, and Johannesson, people who've never been to the movies have mortality rates four times higher than those who attend occasionally. Finally, film teaches us, and makes us connect to others and explore places and people we could otherwise never meet. To quote Tom Chirac, quote, Movies are a form of communication, and that communication, those stories, come from societies. Not just where society is presently and what it's doing now, but where society has been. Movies allow people to be taken places they can't get to on their own. End quote. Film has major effects on society, economics, and even politics, but to me the biggest effect is on the person. We have, in film, a new way of communication, greater ability to empathize, widen emotional boundaries, and ultimately a heavily psychologically impactful art form. We go to the movies to educate ourselves, relate to others, and feel what it is to be human. That's why we go. Psychology has proven itself to be a necessary ingredient for a good movie. When a film is able to create stunning visual imagery, invoke underlying mental imagery, and use archetypical storylines and relatable characters, it is naturally easier to accept. These can more easily be accomplished by examining basic psychology of the human mind. Combine it with good acting and accurate storytelling, and we cannot help but let ourselves fall into the second reality, our disbelief happily suspended. To quote Tom Chirac and many thousands of others over the course of the past century, see you at the movies.